Welcome to DN News in Review. I'm your host, Lou Ismay, and we welcome Keith Rose back, our guest for the day. Thank you. Got a lot of things to talk about and a lot of things to remember. And while we're on the subject of remembering 25 years ago, this week or so, the Exxon Valdez, the Loyal, in Alaska. 25 years ago, big outcry. Oil tankers now, built with double hulls. At least there's a chance that if the outer hull is punctured, the oils will remain still in the tanker. But the, the, the area has not recovered. There's still damage. And not all, all the oil has been removed. There's still some on the ground underneath, under, uh, underneath the uh, waters. There's another anniversary. We're still in Iraq in a way that happened 11 years ago. Protests all over the world still went in Iraq. We've messed up that country. We've messed ourselves up. There's going to be blowback someday. Uh, there's a likelihood and we have to be careful. We went into Iraq under false pretenses. We went in, we used depleted uranium. Depleted uranium is re uranium that's been used in nuclear reactors and is partially um, changed in composition, but it's very, very valuable being used in projectiles, uh, bullets, uh, bombs, make them hard and harder and uh, stronger, should say. And when they are used, they break up into little tiny particles, almost like dust. And that blows around the countryside. Depleted uranium still is radioactive. It destroys the land, cannot be used for ag agriculture again, as far as we know and it destroys people. Birth defects. There are unnumbered birth defects in Iraq. That's a fact. Birth defects in Americans who were there and other people who were fighting in Iraq. So there's a blowback in our country. This is a dangerous situation. Are we aware? Put this on here. You picking up some of this sound? You're good. You're good. Okay. You're good. We're, we're lucky. I'm a lot better now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, the situation in Iraq is still haunting us. We're sending millions of dollars worth of weapons, ammunition, supplies to help the Iraqi government fight the terrorism that's rampant in the country. It's almost retrograde. Women are being uh, 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 harassed. Uh, children who are deformed 
are not cared for. There isn't facility enough for that. So we have caused havoc there. We've ho caused havoc to in our country, to our own people, who were deployed at those times. Perhaps we ought to think about not entering into any kind of warfare again. We're prepared for it. We certainly have the greatest, most efficient military in the world. Hopefully we'll decide not to use it. Whatever it is, perhaps we should keep in mind what we have wrought. Not you or me necessarily, but we as a people. We all other things to talk about. Nelson, well, can I? Uh, oh, sure. Can I chime in before oh, we leave that subject? Because um, accountability, the word accountability, has to be raised concerning our use of what can only be accurately described as chemical weapons in Iraq. Okay. We used chemical warfare in that country on all of those people, on all of that land, and on all of our soldiers that boots were on the ground. And there's no denying that. And as you mentioned, the long-term ramifications of our decision to use chemical weapons is going to be very haunting. And when you look at some of the results of the birth defects, you're talking about the most horrific sights you could ever imagine. And we are, as Americans, are responsible for this. We're going around and saying to Syria and Assad that it's an atrocity for him to use chemical weapons against his people. Well, the reality is we used it against our people and against all of those Iraqis um, with this depleted uranium. And the half-life, we're talking about thousands of years of impact on this land, we now will be responsible for. I ask all Americans to really ask yourself, is this the nation that we want to be? Is this who we who we are as a people? Is this the level of sensitivity and respect for mankind that we have? Is this the moral nation or lack thereof that we are? There should be everybody, everyone should be disgusted by our actions and we should begin to hold our nation accountable for actions of this nature. It's just wrong on every level. Well, Keith, thank you for pointing that out. And we also want to keep in mind that this is not just defects in one generation. Their children and their grandchildren will be affected. We know that from the situation in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, in Japan. It's not just one generation that suffers. It's several generations that suffer. That radioactive material really is inexcusable to use on anybody. And by the way, white phosphorus was used in Fallujah, and we don't know where else, but it was used, and that is a deadly thing. That destroys not only just people, but land too. So, and those, as Keith pointed out, could be called chemical weapons, even though they're not the chemical weapons that we usually think about, such as war, ga war gases. Well, we can go on to other things. There's a man named Ra Ra Ryan Shapiro. He's a graduate student working on a dissertation. He's brought several lawsuits. Um, he's brought a lawsuit against the um, National uh, uh, Security Agency, the FBI, the uh, uh, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. 
He's brought hundreds and hundreds of, of, of um, uh, lawsuits. He's been very successful in getting responses. The uh, big question with Mandela is, are the details that have not been revealed, how the CIA exposed Mandela to the South African apartheid government, 1962, spent 27 years in jail. One of the things that Shapiro wants to know is why was Nelson Mandela on the U.S. terrorist list until 2008? Why did it take so long to remove him? he have been out of jail? Government of uh, South Africa? President? Why? Shapiro Halsa has brought two other lawsuits. Um, he wants to know why in Houston the FBI uh, allegedly found, uh, discovered an assassination plot using snipers to kill uh, leaders of the Occupy Houston uh, a couple of years ago. Why was that kept secret? Why were the leaders not informed? Uh, there was a, uh, this is a 211 plot. Um, federal District Judge Rosemary Collier uh, agrees with Shapiro just to say there was a national emergency or this is secret information is not enough. There have to be facts revealed. And Shapiro also wants to know, he's got another set of lawsuits. Actually, he's got 700 FOIA, Freedom of Information, requests in at the moment. And he's looking for uh, about 350,000 documents. They have not been revealed to us, American public. He wants to know why he is on a terrorist list, in a sense wants to know specifically why animal rights people and environmentalists are considered terrorists, danger to this country. Now we already know that environmentalists have been in jail called t as terrorists and we know that, that animal rights people are in jail. What's going on? Are we interested? Do we care? Environmentalists and animal rights people are not known to be violent. They're pacifists. But they are dangerous to some. Who are they? Sometimes it seems if, uh, as if our federal agencies create laws on their own. They operate not within the Constitution, but outside the Constitution. Hopefully we understand that, or at least become just informed. This has been going on. Keith, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, you know, this immediately makes me think of the statistics about where our nation is as far as um, freedom of the press. And this gentleman making all these requests to get these documents made available so that we can know the truth of what happened and how our government is involved. And some things you can't undo, you know, this is the past. But what you certainly can do is learn from it and hopefully make sure these same things aren't done again or aren't continuing to happen. And the sad truth is we know a lot of this activity continues and is um, really protected by our government in their veil of secrecy. So uh, I commend him for asking all the tough questions and putting himself in harm's way because we know what happens when you want to expose any of the dirty laundry of the United States, then you become a terrorist. And how are you a terrorist if you're just looking for answers and, you know, wanting to hold our government accountable. That's supposed to be, you know, the purpose behind the Founding Fathers uh, setting up this government in the manner that it's been set up. Yeah. Now, we talk many times about racism in our country, how it affects all of us, 
and it certainly affects the people who are at the receiving end of all of this racism. People of color, Afro-Americans, Latinos, people from other countries. It's almost as if white supremacy still lurks around in the nooks and crannies of our government and our lives. One bit of good news, New York City, uh, firefighters won a case receiving uh, uh, a large reward which will cover some of the back pay that they were denied. So black and Latino firefighters now in New York City have some retribution and uh, better uh, chances at jobs. Um, Paul Washington was the past president of the Vulcan Society of Black Firefighters who first the lawsuit. He's a captain of a, 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 a engine 284, I think it is, in Crown Heights in Brooklyn. And a lawyer, Richard Levy, or Levy, was the lead attorney on the case, and they were interviewed in the democracy now. Lawsuit was brought in 2007. There's over $100 million worth of back pay that's going to be divided amongst those who were affected. Firefighting is a very important job, and it's a very good job. It's passed on, it's a father to son, it's grandfather to father to son kind of a situation. Good pay, good respect, and to get a fair chance at these kinds of jobs is what this has been all about. Got another situation, a documentary. And Keith, maybe you want to comment on Dear White People? Yes, uh, thank you, Lou. Dear White People is a documentary film that actually just won an award at the Sundance Film Festival. And because of its being received so well at the Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah, um, there's been a number of studios that have picked up the rights. So very likely we all will be seeing Dear White People um, at a theater near you in the very near future. And what this film is about, and it's, um, it's um, set at an Ivy League school, a fictional Ivy League school, and a number of black students basically are taking up the um, complex issue of being black on this campus and basically saying, hey, you know, we belong here too. We're not, you know, there's nothing to say that we didn't earn the right or um, shouldn't be here. And it talks about all the racial tension that goes on in this environment. And one of the interesting things as I'm speaking now, I'm Keith Rhodes with my personal opinion on this issue and I don't speak for all black people. We don't all think alike and don't have the same opinions on every issue or on most issues. We have different, differing opinions. But this talks about how in many instances, if you're the only black person and there's an issue of race that comes up, then of course you're supposed to speak on behalf of the entire race. Um, and it talks about all the other little nuances and it uses comedy uh, as a means of telling these different issues, but it tackles a lot of different um, issues behind race and politics and uh, all of the various nuances that goes on with it. The thing I like about this is I feel, and this is my humble opinion, that the more we talk about things like race and the the reality of racism still being alive and well in, in America and in many other countries, I think that creates the opportunity to break down a lot of those barriers and a lot of the ignorance that's associated with um, discriminating or hating someone or disliking with them, someone simply because of the color of their skin, simply because of their race, their religion, their sexual orientation, or any other reason one can uh, sight unseen hate someone 
because they're different. And I feel like we should all be embracing the individuality that we all have and honoring the fact that we all are different. And through dialogue, I believe we can begin to break down those barriers. Yeah, thank you. It'd be interesting to see that film. Something is going on in Japan. <clears throat> United States sailors who are aboard the, the uh, aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan are suing the Tokyo uh, Electric and Power Company, TEPCO. Three years ago, when we had this, this uh, uh, situation, 211, 200, yeah, three years ago, meltdown, asking for help. The U.S. government sent the, the, the uh, aircraft carrier to Fukushima to provide help, food, blankets, medical supplies, whatever was needed. On the way to Fukushima, to Fukushima, TEPCO did not give any warning as to the seriousness of the situation. And so the Ronald Reagan sailed into a plume of radioactive material. 30 times higher than the safe level. It took whatever precautions it could, but not before radioactive water was pumped aboard. The sailors bathed, showered in it, they drank it, it was used in the food preparation. You didn't know that at the time until they came aboard and it was tested. So they were exposed to radioactive plume and to, and to radioactive water and TEPCO still remained quiet about the seriousness of the situation. You may remember that even the, the government in Tokyo was not informed. Uh, the prime minister had to fly himself he flew to the site and talked with the workers and got the true picture, but not from the company itself. So a number of sailors are suing. There are health defects, birth defects. People who are healthy can't walk, can't work, can't do things. Government, U.S. government has not done anything to help them. They brought this lawsuit. We'll see what's going to happen. Now, Charles Bonner, their attorney, um, spoke with uh, uh, Amy Goodman on Democracy Now. There's a Lieutenant Steve Simmons, an officer, who was also interviewed. We get an idea of what the ser seriousness is and how serious it is, and what shall we do? Maybe there's not much we can do, but at least we know what's going on, and we can give our support, whatever that might be. So there are other things. Before we leave, Dad, uh, Keith, you want to, does anything come to mind on this thing? Well, it's just, once again, it's sad, but it becomes reoccurring themes that there's an accident or there's um, negligence and, you know, big money, corporate, Amer corporate uh, corporations often are behind it in their pursuit of their almighty dollar. They aren't held accountable. They don't take responsibility for any kind of mistakes they've made and then because of their lobbying efforts they're able to sweep whatever um, negligence that they've um, are responsible for under the rug and this is something that is systemic in our society now and until we all the common folk you know stand up to this corporate welfare and it is welfare far beyond social welfare 
until we stand up to this corporate welfare and say we're going to hold you accountable we're going to hit you where it hurts in your pockets that's why it's so important to have really sizable uh, and enforceable um, damages against uh, these companies because that's the only thing they will ever understand and when they know that there's potential financial accountability and penalty for their actions then and only then may they do the right thing or begin to go in that direction short of that they'll continue to do these atrocities because they know it's good business financially when they know they have you know senators, congressmen, legislators, judges in their back pocket, and the fine is going to be a lot less than what they've made by committing these crimes. And this is a global situation. It is global. It's, it's these trade treaties, largely the idea of people in the United States, World Trade Organization, we find this thing, we find NAFTA and the North of, um, uh, uh, American trade agreements. We, Canada, Mexico, the United States, we find all kinds of things, jobs lost, not just here, but elsewhere. Uh, uh, trade agreements that take precedent over the people in the countries. The governments they can't even protect their own people. The worst of all is the one that Mr. Obama wants to get a fast track on, an up and down vote. He's, in, in, he's impatient. It's the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Agreement Project, TPP. What, what will happen is that the, all the countries who sign on to this, and a lot of them are resisting, they sign on to it. It provides a template or a pattern Trade is not the main idea. Trade is not free. It's considered free trade, but it's not free. People suffer. It would mean that the countries in the Pacific who sign on to this thing would be a platform like, or a docking kind of agreement that people can add on to be, become members later on, actually gives the power to all decisions to the corporations. So no nation will be able to protect its own people, to choose what is best for its own people. We have to be careful. Corporations now actually do rule the world, the international corporations. And the governments have very little to say. And governments also allow these things to happen because they're part of this whole structure. And we're learning more about it. Seems that it's a regular revelation, little bits here, little bit there. Pretty soon we'll begin to understand. Pretty soon maybe we will decide what should be done about this. Well, other things, let's take a, take a look at the uh, current issue of the this year's Farmers Almanac and take a quick look at what's coming up, the weather is expected for um, the month of April. Here. April is going to be a little bit less precipitation. No big changes in temperature. It's going to be cool. We also, later on in the month, will expect snow, rain to snow, uh, later on in the month. But it'll be a cool, cool April. Something else, while we're talking about uh, magazines, here's an issue of the Nation magazine. Current issue, Pesticides and the Young Brain. It turns out that around the world, wherever pesticides have been used, 
are being used, especially in our country, and this is devoted mainly to our country. Path-breaking study detects a range of developmental problems in children. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> Born to mothers who toiled in pesticide-treated fields. But will anything be done? Clear evidence that the pesticides used in the fields transmitted by the mother to the home on her clothes, shoes, gets into her bloodstream, the children suffer. Now, here's a photograph of one mother being tested. In the fields, Boca Venino no Mata, a little poison won't kill you, but it turns out that it does. And yes, it does affect the babies, their brains. And it affects, it dis, dis, endocrine disruption. And so the baby now is not, it grows up and is affected. So it's not just the children in, whose parents work in the, in the agribusiness, but also children in urban situations. Pesticides so, used to control cockroaches. Yeah. Now, We've raised the question before, and we'll raise it again. We consider children to be important. What would the world be like if children truly mattered? What would the world be like if we adults conduct our affairs as if children really did matter. Would we have children living in poverty? Would we have them infected with the pesticides? Would we having them, would they be going, uh, 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 in, suffering from hunger? Would their parents be uh, uh, Unemployed, what would happen? What would happen if children truly mattered? Would they be going through uh, piles of trash in places in the world, looking for bits of food to, to eat, or bits of metal or things to sell so there could be some food on the tables? What would happen if children truly mattered? if we conducted our affairs as if that was true. And one other thought, the situation with the planet. What would happen if we treated the planet as a garden, taking care of it so that it survives and can produce? What would happen? What would life be like? Want to think about it? One more, th a couple of things, or more things to talk about. Here, Keithy, you're, you're sitting there silently. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining. It makes me think of the John Lennon song, Imagine. Imagine what this world would be like if we all, like you said, just put a premium on every human life. You know, it just would be such a beautiful place. And, you know, as we become more internationalized, um, hopefully we will place a value. You know, it's so easy when it's not at your front door or it's not, you know, on your street or in your neighborhood. It's easy to turn a blind eye on some of the things that you discussed, Lou. 
And, you know, you would hope we'll come to a point where we really do put a premium on each and every life and that everybody should have the right to food, shelter, and education, you know, just the, the simple basic necessities of life. Um, I, I imagine and pray for those days to one day get here and, you know, it's something that we could all do in an instant if everybody agreed to share a little bit more and, you know, if we could, you know, curtail the greed. And, you know, unfortunately, it's the greed of just a very small few that control the culture of, of billions, you know. So, you know, it's possible if we can just have a change in um, philosophy. We talk about the decision, our Supreme Court permitting organizations to spend as much money as they want on elections. And here's a little chart from this current issue of um, The Nation magazine. Political spending by the 10 biggest unions in the 2012 election. <laughs> Ask me, all of these AFL, CIO, Carpenters, Teamsters, CWA, UPW. Here. And then the Coke now, Brothers. <laughs> it's 155 <laughs> million. million dollars. Now, by the Koch brothers, four and twelve million. Now, look at the comparison. All of these don't nearly come up to about here, but here. Now, these are. So you're talking about roughly those. All those unions combined represent around 10 million, 13 million people versus two brothers. Right, and the companies or the organizations that they back. Yeah. This is what we've become. Now, this amount of money by these two brothers, principal of the two brothers, started the Tea Party movement. Yep. Now, perhaps we should think, has the Tea Party movement been successful? Has it caused more difficulties for the one political party? We'll have to see. But just to look at the difference. For two people with unlimited money compared to all the rest of us, unlimited. Yeah, well, they're both they worth around $40 billion each. Yeah. So it's not like they can't afford it. That's a drop in the bucket, $400 million. And when I got, if you got $40 billion, $400 million is not really, you don't even miss that. Yeah, yeah. Now, <clears throat> take another look here at another magazine quickly. <clears throat> this is the current issue of Yes Magazine. Now, an interesting article having to do with schools. The myth behind public school failure. Now it turns out that the facts may be that the public schools are not failing. They're actually doing pretty well. But there's this rush to privatize. Now the idea of privatizing really got started during the Ronald Reagan administrations. The idea originated with a man named uh, Friedman, who was a professor at the University of Chicago. And Milton Friedman convinced Ronald Reagan and lots of other people 
that government was too big, that it should be made smaller, and that industry, individuals, other organizations could do a better job of running the government. Well, why do corporations want our public schools? Here. Annual education budget funded by taxpayers. That's it, annually. That much money goes to instruction. But now look. Controlling standardized testing corporations set themselves up as arbiters of success or failure. That's been going on with standardized tests, really used extensively, especially after 1945, after the end of hostilities in World War II. It became big business. 20 to $30 billion a year is enormous business. And if you're one of the few corporations that are controlling these, uh, this industry and the standardized testing industry, you know, you got a lot of power. That's a lot of political might. Sure. So, it works. One of the world's largest textbook com publishers. Pearson. Pearson. Now, the Gates Foundation was involved. It put states to adopt national common core testing standards. And Gates partnered with Pearson. The K-12 K-12 courses aligned with Common Core and made the test and the testing standards. Now, here. Failing public schools are closed, open the door for privatization. And look at the growth. Over a period of 10 years, last 10 years, now there are 6,000 charter schools in the country. Charter schools sounds like a good idea, but it turns out that a lot of the youngsters really don't get all the benefits. That and they they're, not, they're, they're not performing. And they're not, right. No. Not all. I mean, we can't just throw all of them into one uh, basket, oh, but a lot right. of the charter schools are not performing any better than the public schools. Right. That's right. $25 billion a year of taxpayer money is already going to private companies. Now, how do they cut private companies uh, profit? Well, spent on administration, less per student spent on instruction. So now, do we have here? If you get $366 per student, represent a potential profit of $20 billion. Somebody's profiting off the taxpayer's dollars instead of improving the quality of, That's exactly of what education. Is this is right. Now, public school teachers pay, but for the charter schools, it's this much that the teacher gets. This is an average. So Big the teachers difference. are the ones who are taking the hit. Not only that, but the children are. And the children. So because how is that it, good? Because these are frequently part-time people or people who are not uh, qualified uh, as, 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 as uh, uh, licensed teachers. So we can understand why the major teachers unions are up in arms about the charter schools. Yeah. And yeah. rightly so. But now look at the property. Walmart in 2012 profit was 17 billion. Bank of America, uh, Bank of America was 4 billion. And in the educational business. That's why they're there. Sort of like why John Dillinger robbed banks. That's where the <laughs> money is. <laughs> yeah. So in this debate about public schools and private schools. We ought to look at the incentives there. Think about, rethink this idea. 
because the public is paying for it. And who should, should have, profit? Yeah, who should profit if we're paying for it? Yeah. And should there be profiteering by corporate America or international corporations for uh, on our taxpayer dollars? That's supposed to be educating our children, and that should be the primary objective. Uh, and you know, having quality teachers and making sure we take care of the yeah. teachers who are so important in that process should be that shouldn't be compromised for some corporate profits. Yeah. You see, this business of testing, testing, standardized tests, that's really the, the idea of accountability. But when we learn, accountability is how we use what we learn, how we are as people. Education is more than learning numbers and facts. And memorizing and numbers memorizing and facts. memorizing things. There's a lot of innovation and a lot of creativity. But what kind of citizens do we have through our educational process? What makes our country stronger? Is it competing in the world for the business? Or is working together in the world for the benefit of the world? One of the questions raised. Well, Lou, one final comment I'd like to make about this is teachers are arguably one of our most valued resources. They deal with our children. They teach our children. They shape the lives of our children. Yet, if you look at that charter school um, example, teachers are being asked to reduce their pay. We should be increasing the pay of the, t the people who are with our children for more hours in the course of a day than pretty much anyone else, not reducing. And, you know, that's the problem I have with the charter schools is they're asking these teachers to take less and do more versus, you know, saying here's some additional resources for you to help you do a better job because we know often the teacher is not just limited to helping those students in the classroom. They become consultants. They become, you know, quasi-parents for a lot of these children. They're role models. Um, so, you know, there was a time where the teaching profession was such an honored profession and such a coveted profession. We need to get back to really appreciating and compensating teachers appropriately for the job that we're asking them to do. Yes. And one thing though, when we, we might want to consider, many, many teachers have to hold more than one job. Exactly. It just is not possible. And to, to live and to, to work, so many, many teachers. And in the summertime, you'll find that many teachers hold additional, they hold full-time jobs. And even during the vacation times from school, many they, of them are holding no full-time. To, yeah, to make ends no meet, they have yeah. to. So in the long run, who suffers? Now Our children. You see, one of the things about education is that we all know so much about it. We know everything there is to know because we've gone through the system as children. <laughs> but what about the quality of what we know about education? Right. And what really goes on? And as children, do we really understand? No. But we can learn. We can do better. A couple of quick cartoons and we have some other things. Here, this is one. There's the maze. That's not a pathway to my citizenship. That's a pathway to your future election. Electability. You see. <laughs> <laughs> right, here's another one. Poor man gets so many, has, takes a rap for so many things. Why would you think he can control Russia? all tied up there with Walking Washington, D.C. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> anyway. Tail that wags the dog. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's a big conference, a very important conference held recently in Albany at the law school. The game of drones. 
the uses and potential abuses of unmanned area vehicles in the United States and abroad, and it was held a week or so ago, free to the public at the Albany Law School. A very, very interesting discussion. They can be legitimate weapons of war. They can be invading people's privacy. What shall we do about the drones? What kind of laws might we have sometime? So it's in the news. The proceedings are going to be published maybe a year from now. You might want to look forward to reading that report when it comes out. But the debate went on from all kinds of perspectives. <coughs> Attorneys, uh, people who know details, a judge was there giving his opinion. Albany Law School, and there are these kinds of seminars that held regularly. They're called moot courts. They're held in the courtroom atmosphere, and they're conducted in the manner of a, of a court hearing. Some other things happening quickly. The Iroquois Indian Museum is now open again for the year. Uh, March 29th was the opening day, and we'll show the schedule from time to time. There'll be a spring party coming up in May, but the museum is open now. Um, this is important for those who are more than baby boomers. Toy show. Holiday Inn, Wolf Road, Albany, Sunday the 6th of April. We're going to put that on the calendar. This is coming up next month. We've shown this a number of times. It's still very important. The legacy of slavery. We're still feeling it in many ways. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, April 11th to 13th. The eighth step coming up. Saturday, the 29th, tomorrow, Annie and the Hedonists. Oh, I didn't want in. to put that back. Okay. We didn't. Sure. I don't think they had a chance to. Get it. Okay, I'm getting impatient. Here we go. There Annie and the Hedonists, Saturday, the 29th. Eighth step in, at Proctor's. Um, Old Socks Festival. There's activities here. Come, well, here we go. The fourth Sunday, uh, fourth Wednesdays. Coming up, uh, the third Monday next month, African drum class. Something going on in, in Troy at the Sanctuary for Independent Media. This is coming up on Saturday. Albert Myers. Maylis, documentary filmmaker, and on Sunday, Louise Mate, a city uh, found in her bustling urban vibes. <laughs> I'm mumbling here. <laughs> city of San pa Paolo. Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao, Sao Paulo, yeah. Brazil. Um, solidarity notes. We want to keep remember, this is the first page of uh, it, uh, comment. Reminder that the U.S. minimum wage is one of the lowest in the developed world. 725. People arguing about $10. It ranks 26 out of 27 developed nations. Yep. How about that? Oh. No yeah. wonder we have problems in our country. 26 yeah. out of 20 seven developed nations yeah. and people are complaining who are complaining. Yeah. The wealthy are complaining about raising the minimum wage. Yeah. Now, $15 an hour would be helpful, but $20 an hour, would, this, this would be if there were other benefits. Well, at $15 an hour, they're saying that might support a decent standard standard of living as long as there were other benefits such as national health care and low-cost housing. Right. Now, 
it's more realistic to think of $20 an hour as a minimum wage if we don't have these other kinds of help. Correct. So it's something we might want, might want to consider. Now, pretty soon it's going to be time to go. We want to cover a couple of other things beforehand. The, um, Mr. Obama is talking about changing NASA, National Security Agency, phone calls, having the phone calls kept by telephone companies. The World Health Organization recently reported that worldwide in 2012, 7 million people died of air pollution. 7 million people wow. around the world. You know, we put our corporations, communities, we dump things in the air. Who pays the price? No controls. We don't run controls. Duke Energy, another spill, toxic coal ash, 61 million gallons spill. BP, another Re revelation, um, very recent revelation, another oil spill, uh, not in the water, ocean, but in land. So who is going to control who? In New York City, in January, 53,600 homeless people living in shelters. 53,600. 53,000. We can do better. Every single night. Yeah. We can do better. Some countries, some cities are doing real well. They're giving homeless people apartments. The people find that they they live better. They're not, they're not on the streets. They're putting their lives together. It's a less expensive way than taking care of them, getting them to emergency shelters, getting them to emergency situations in hospitals, getting them detoxed and so forth. It's happening around the country. We'll get into it some other time. You'll be, well, it'll be in the newspapers, I imagine, uh, but we'll talk about it another time. That's the best way to take care of the homeless. Thank you for being with us. I've been your host, Louis May, and our good old friend, Keith Rose has been with us again. Thanks, love. Pleasure to have you around. Here. Pay attention to what's going on. Support the food banks and the food pantries. Uh, think about planting some vegetables in your front lawn. Uh, help to feed other people if you can't use it yourself. So look forward to being together again. Thank Glenn Janet for <laughs> Jared for his engineering. Pay attention. We, Pay the attention. people, hand in hand. People understand that there's an answer, there's a way. We, the people, have to say. So send the orders to prepare that we, the people, do.